much influence in the work. I don't think I'm getting much, much projection here. But, uh, go back in my teaching days, since I've already talked about them, and push those out. You know, I didn't mention it. I wanted to mention it real fast. Believe it or not, it was actually the toga party I went to last night. No, the pastor did not. I actually did wear a sweater. I figured that was my closest auto that I could get. So, uh, so, uh, but we're down to those last IMs, and this whole period of Lent was to begin to identify who Jesus says that Jesus is. Because in Lent, we said if, if our focus is on repentance and understanding that if we can't say who Jesus is, if we don't know that answer when someone asks us, and, and it's of no condemnation, nature, but across both churches over a period of years, I find, unfortunately, a little more often than I would like, I would like, 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 like to know, is it some of us just can't say who Jesus is. We have trouble saying who he is historically at all, and much less who he is in our life. Not that they're different, but they're two different experiences. And today, tied into last week, and last week was, I am the gate. There are two references to the shepherd we talked about, and I said it, Wesley, I had the chancel rails there, and ours is, 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 is down for now. But normally it comes right up here, and there's nothing but this one gate. And last week, as unpopular was it, no one challenged me in this past week. I said either, either you agreed or you just didn't want to challenge me on it because I figured that there were some folks who probably weren't real comfortable with the one way. Because our society says, well, you know, we got to fit everybody in and we got to do all this. <coughs> one way is, unfortunately, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, is the answer. So here's the gate. And we had the sheep pen that we talked about. And the sheep were in there. And then at nighttime, you closed the gate. Now, close the gate. It didn't mean that a hinge and a swinging door. We built up briars and brambles and stuff. And then, and then we touched on it a little bit for last week. We said it would come in for this week. Then, as darkness fell and things were settled in, the shepherd laid down and slept in front of the gate. Now, most of us didn't farm sheep, but we need that understanding to understand where we're going today and what this means when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Last week he told us he was the gate. There was one way into a sheep pen and one way out. That's it. The gate. And he's the gate, not the briars and brambles. So uh, today, that we... We actually heard Donnie read said, I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. All right, we didn't farm sheep or ranch sheep, but do you get what he was telling folks and what they heard? He is laying down his life. That shepherd at night said, over my dead body will the lions and wolves Get these sheep, because they're mine. And if they get the sheep, they might as well have me too, because that's my entire life. That's everything I have. So Jesus makes this statement, 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, they didn't really understand how he was going to do it, because they didn't see themselves as sheep. And they weren't sure what that meant, but we're going to get there. The hired hand, he says in, in, in verse 12, is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolves coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Now, the hired per person, this is different than the actual shepherd. Shepherd had to take a few days off, had to hire somebody to replace him. All right? Got to keep that in perspective. In verse 13, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep. It means it doesn't, not that he doesn't take care of them, he doesn't care for them. He's got no skin in the game. He doesn't have any relationship to them. He doesn't know their names. They're sheep. Now let's 
look at this story in John a little bit historically. First is understanding this is a parable. That's what Jesus used a lot. He used a story. He, 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 he took things that people understood and tried to teach them spiritual things. For those of us who were in teaching, we often did that. We, 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 we would take what was known and try to adapt it to describe the unknown. I would do that in classes with kids. I would do something that I knew with which they could identify and try to draw them into what I was teaching at the, at the time. So here, what's happening here is this parable is extremely unique because guess what? It is the only parable in the book of John. The absolute only one. Matthew, now go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get all kinds of notes. You know, if I was really good at all that memorization stuff, I could tell you exactly how many parables that Jesus spoke, but I don't. But they were there. But in the book of John, there's one. And there's one that fits in in chapter 10 here that doesn't make any sense. We well, say, yeah, the parable makes sense. No, no, no. Read. Let's go back and look at 9 and look at 11. And John isn't talking anything about parables. He isn't talking anything that fits in. It looks like when I used to give kids assignments and tell them that they had to do two pages of work, and they'd get a page and a page and three quarters done, and the last quarter page was about their dog and their cat, and it, it was just filling. They were just writing. And that's what it looks like Jesus is doing here. He's just shoving this in here in the middle of things until you understand what was going on. He was in the temple. He was teaching. And understand that there was, it was... It, it, was, it was a festival time in the, temple, in the temple. It was the festival of the tabernacles. That was the original festival that they were celebrating. However, in 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus created a new festival at the same time of year. The new festival was called the Festival of Dedication, or in 2016, Hanukkah. It's the festival of light. He did it because without going into a three-credit course in, old, in the Old Testament, the temple in 164 was being rededicated because it had been in defilement. It had been taken over. We, we're not going to go into all the history and who all was involved, but it had been taken over, so he created this. So what apparently was happening is Jesus is in the temple, and now... There is this discrepancy. Which festival is most important? Lord, who's going to be at your right hand? Well, who's going to decide if we have green paint or red paint? Said, who's, said, who's going to decide on what we do? Sure, that never happens much. But it was happening in the Old Testament church. And so Jesus is in there and I'm talking to him and there's this, and he can tell that there's this disagreement. There's this family battle for power. Those who say, hey, let's go with Hanukkah, and let's don't pay any mind to the tabernacle thing. That's cool. And there are those who are saying, I don't care about this rededication. I think that's important. It's been years and all that. But the original rules are we've always done it this way. Famous last words of many churches. We've always done it this way. And so Jesus goes, he senses that he's seen in the middle of this discussion between 9 and 11, he's going, you, 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 you guys just don't get it. God's right here in the midst of you. Festival, festival, whatever it is, stop this. Because he looks at them and he says, here's the answer. And what's interesting is he literally uses scripture from Ezekiel 34. Because as part of the festival, that was the main scripture of, of, uh, of the focus. Now, we're real good at that as uh, Christians. We love Christmas trees. Are they biblical? And no. We've got Easter coming up, and I tell you, the holiest of holies is probably the most pagan, borrowed symbols at all. Christmas is tame compared to Easter. I mean, Easter goes back to the ancient Asher poles. It's a fertility rite. It's, I mean, some of the things that we use. So we borrow that, and Jesus says, okay, I'm going to use your own message here. 
and I'm going to tell you how to straighten this battle thing out that you're going. So he takes Ezekiel 30, the, uh, 30, the uh, 34, about the feast in the temple, and he's doing this, and he's talking about the, about the sheep. And then he's tying it into some of the other stuff. If, if we look back as Christians, we see in Matthew a previous variation of this, of this 99 and 1. We love the 99 and 1. The shepherd is the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes to find the one because we're the one. And we like that. And that was the point. But that was kind of a softer shepherd story. In this shepherd story, it gets a little more pointed. A little bit different. different. And, and, and unlike that one, it's, it's, it's that Jesus says this. He says that there are uh, there that, that there are robbers and thieves, and there's only one gate. And that is the gate. And anybody else is a wolf or a hireling. Jesus knew that everyone in the temple would identify with the image of the good shepherd. He understood that because in Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied about the good shepherd. And again, we said in the beginning, remember these, 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 these I am's are I am. That means I'm Yahweh, I'm God. That's the first thing he said. And that was uncomfortable. And then he says, I am, and in each of the seven I am's, he describes specifically, and this one is messianic, more than any other. Because Isaiah said in 40, in verse 11, and for those of us who love Hamel's Messiah, we probably have to sing in our head to be able to say it. See the Lord comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those with young. I am the good shepherd. And everybody's going, mm -hmm. he's saying I am again, he's Yahweh, and now he's saying he is the Messiah. Jesus says, I am the good she 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 shepherd. I am also the Messiah. I am the one who you should be following. Stop worrying about these daggum fe the, the, the festivals. They're important, but your focus is so tied on them that you're missing the God right in front of you. Now, Jesus does three things here, or the good shepherd does, and Jesus, he uh, fulfills it. First, a good shepherd should sacrifice. That's number one. A good shepherd has to sacrifice. I had to sacrifice time. I, I had to build a sheep pen. I had to bring them in. So last week we talked about that, that, that if we were in the city, in town, there would be like five sheep herds in one sheep pen because all the shepherds were going to share them. And when I walked in, I said, I called my sheep. Here, sheep, sheep. I don't know how you call sheep. No. <laughs> so he's doing God's things, right? Here, I call the sheep. My sheep knew my voice, and they would come. The other sheep would stand there, a lot like our dogs and cats do, and go, yeah, whatever. Because if you're not my master, then I'm not answering. And each, each shepherd could, could do it. So the shepherd would sacrifice. And Jesus begins, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd will lay down his life. Unlike bad ones who only look after number one, every one of those sheep were precious to him. He knew their names. If you have more than one pet, you know all their names. Hopefully you still remember all the names of your kids. You probably would like to forget them once in a while, but that's all right. I felt that way yesterday about my oldest. God love her. But these ideas that you come in and speak and know them, there's something vested. However, if I have to take time off, or like now, when I go to substitute teach, I'll go to substitute to, to, to teach, and I go teach. I love the kids. They're great kids. I'm barely trying to figure, figure, figure out who Johnny is or who Mary is. They walk out the door and they're gone. I don't know. Would I go out of my way to teach for them? Yes. Would I go out of my way to protect them from someone else? Yes, I would. However, I can tell you it would not have been the same as it was from 1977. To 2008, 2010, I don't know okay. um, that because those were my kids. Really, they were your all's kids. But to me, they were my kids. And no one was going to mess with my kids. And then there are my two girls. And it's a whole different level then. Well, the good shepherd sees us that way. They are willing to sacrifice because the hireling, when push comes to shove, I'm laying there, here comes a pack, <coughs> sorry to say a herd, a fox, uh, of, of wolves. 
coming in, and there are so many of them that I know I can't stop them. It's not just one or two. It's so many, they're going to overtake me, they're going to kill the sheep and kill me. And guess what? They ain't paying me enough. I'm out of here. I'm gone. Have the sheep, but you're not having me. But the good shepherd, the one who owned the sheep, would die with them because it wasn't worth living without them. That's sacrifice. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. They knew the difference. I'm not sure we always do. This was huge. And Jesus said he was alluding to it. And they were figuring out, so how's he going to die for sheep? How's that going to do it? He was talking about the cross. That's what he meant. In fact, Paul said it this, or said it, said it this way. God shows his love for, for us in that while we were yet sinners. sinners, thank you, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. If we really believe this, we would love the Good Shepherd the same as He loves us within our abilities. We can't love Him the way He loves us because we're not the Good Shepherd. But how often do we go, well, you know, the pressure's on, so uh, Jesus, you're on your own. When somebody says, 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 who's Jesus? And we go, well, you know, I'd like to tell you, but I really got to go. Because it's going to put us in a life and death type of situation. We think somebody's going to turn on us. Two, the good shepherd should have sympathy. Should make sacrifice. Should have sympathy. Sympathy. A lot of times we, we say empathy. Sympathy is, is really kind of pity on us. He should have pity. And we, you know, I often have empathy for other people, but I don't have a lot of pity for them. But the good shepherd should. The Gospel of John says this. He begins with Jesus saying that the Good Shepherd gives his life for a sheep. But most of what follows speaks of the Good Shepherd's care and sympathy. He had not go on and talk about how he gives his life. He had not talk about the cross, didn't talk about anything. He just goes on and talking. He said bad, he said bad shepherds are just, are just hirelings. He said in, in the contrast, the good knows each one. He knows their name. When I speak, they hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. No one will snatch them out of my hand, is what was read in verse 27 and 28. No one will snatch them. doesn't say we can't jump out of his hand, that we can't be that one sheep that leaves the pen and takes off on our own. But no one's going to snatch us. It's really nice to say, well, the devil made me do it. But in the end, we choose to walk away choose to let him pull this tight. In these verses, notice all the personal pronouns. Everything was personal. It wasn't collective. It was individual. No one will snatch them from my hand. And finally, the good shepherd should search. John in chapter 10 begins with the shepherd calling out his flock in verse 3. The background of this detail we discussed last week about the multiple pens in the herd. He called them out and, and, they, and they would answer. Listen to verse 10 though. Because what happens is we sometimes twist this. And in verse 10 that Jesus says, I have other sheep that belong to this fold. Because back at the beginning, remember it said, my sheep will hear my voice. There, there are those who are more Calvinist in their thoughts, and they say, see, some are chosen, some are not. It's just the way it goes. Oh, no, verse 10 immediately clears that up before we get there. And it says, I have other sheep that don't belong to this sheep pen. He's telling the priests, the rabbis, all the folks in the, tem the temple, I'm coming to you first, but you're not it. There are others. From the very beginning, there was, there, were, there was no second plan. It was a plan from the beginning that all should be saved. <clears throat> and he says, this, he, he says, I must bring them also, and they will listen to, to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Uh-oh, we're back to the one way of the peace, to the power of the cross, and there's only one gate, and that's Christ. And guess what? That, does, that means that we don't get to choose other ways around it. But here he says this, that they're going to hear it. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. If you look up in the commentary, you will find, you will see that the calling out of sheep, that Jesus is actually calling out about the sheep of Israel. He's talking to the Jews. 
I'm coming to you first, but I'm going to go get the Gentiles because they're coming too. The other sheep he wants in a flock are all of those outside. And you know what? For today, it's some of those folks who are outside the church, and some of them drive smart cars. Some of them drive pickup trucks. Some of them walk. Some of them have tattoos. Some of them don't. Some of them don't look like it like us. Some of us have never even heard about God. They have no clue. And Jesus says, I'm going to go get some other sheep. And he's calling us to, to go out and do it. He says, today, today, they are you and me, is what he's saying. Each one of those people. His vision is of a new people, a new church. It's made up of Jew and, and, and of Gentile. This was a missionary reach. In fact, to the point he looked at his disciples, what were his last words in the book of Matthew? Go and make disciples. He says, even in my death, I want my shepherds out there finding the lost And he calls us to lay down our life. Verse 15, it's, it's a parallel to the bond between Jesus and the Father. It's how close he says, I am, my sheep are like me and my Father. He's saying that we're as close to him as he is to God. Do you feel that way? I'm not sure I always do. In fact, I'm not sure I think I should. And yet he's saying we are. The good shepherd is sacrificial when we least deserve it. The good shepherd has sympathy for our plights because he lived it. We pray to a God who literally lived like we did. We could go to go through and say, Lord, you lived it. You understand. Come on, you got to give me a break. And he's going, yeah, I understand it. But that doesn't mean I can know it. Because I've been there and walked it. And I've showed you the way. And finally, <laughs> finally, the good shepherd is searching. Searching. Sacrificial, sympathetic, and searching. And he's searching for the church. Not a church, the church. And he's searching for the people to fill that church. Not those walls, that church. The good shepherd is for all. As we close, we're going to share a song that we all know over and over again. But this is it. This is the description of the good shepherd. The psalmist wrote, he said, it's a wonderful thing. Isn't it a wonderful thing? He said, to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, now you should have a better understanding of what that means. And I, personal, shall not want. You don't have any wants. Oh, I got lots of things I want to do. But my life is taken by the good sh sh shepherd. And a shepherd doesn't push from the back. A shepherd stands in front and says, follow me, because I'm going to take the first arrow. I'm going to take the first lion. I'm going to take the first wolf. And Jesus says, follow him. That's a good shepherd. And when we don't know who Jesus is, that is number five of who the good shepherd is, of who Jesus is. I am the good shepherd. Join us singing our next song together, number 381. If you're reading the harmonies of the book, watch on the screen. Save your life. As you're able, let's stand and sing together.
Go into the world knowing that you can say that you know who Jesus is because he told us who he was. Seven times in one gospel he said, I am, and gave us another example. Today, the example is the good shepherd, the one who doesn't walk out on us. You may have come from a life where people walked out on you every day. People, people may have never been there when you needed them there. People may, never said, follow me. They said, find your own way. Today, today you know that there is a good shepherd. One that's going to lead, say, follow, and never step out of the front of the line. Go and share that. There is a lost world looking for a shepherd. Amen.
his head suddenly looks like this. Boy, it's in me. Yes. Yes. I, yes, I gave him out. Yes, I did. But that doesn't mean he still had one. I know. And I didn't bring any extras today, but I will. All right. Um, are you going? Yeah. I thought I had the copies out when I printed them. I had a bunch of them. I don't have many more. So he, he just went ahead and he just right. told me to write down me and Carol that you're necessary. Yeah, so that's I've got that. Right. So, that's why. But I think I'm covered. Look, I find it. I've, I've got that. I, I, I can give it to me. So I can write down a few All right. Uh, I didn't think he was. I don't know what he's going about. Is, is he going? I, I know Xavier's supposed to be going. I called, no, I made this week, and she said yes, and, uh, yeah. Chloe, is your dad going? I thought Chris said that he thought he wanted to wait on it. Oh. Oh, he is going. Yeah, but the other one went to Wesley. It doesn't matter. 
doing lasagna or like a barbecue or something? You need to speak up because if you're going to get lasagna and salad and go, I'm not hungry, I don't like this, and you're going to starve on Saturday night, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that for, for you, and I don't want to be honest, I don't want to deal with it. Is that everyone like those okay. I mean, she could take the trays of lasagna, stick them in the oven, all of their their cooking while we're down at the convention and doing stuff. Well, maybe it's on the Well, it ain't stovers, is it? Probably. Well, okay. And then that's it. She is just sitting at home and make a lasagna, I guarantee you. All right. All right. Um, so that would save you $15 a head on the Terrence, because that would be a video on you. Now, Saturday night. After we come back from the concert, we will, say we will stop at a, a nice green place called Dumpsters. That's probably going to be five to ten dollars a person. We're not going to do that back there. That's something we really look forward to. Do. Sat Saturday is a long day, so we will start in the morning at probably I think it's eight or nine o'clock. Actually, at the center, we will be waking up around seven in the morning, um, and. Um, Saturday afternoon is the only open time that, that we have. If the weather's good, Fellowship for Shacklings runs uh, sports on the beach, and uh, we can split up into groups. Some of us will go to the beach for that. Some, some may, may just go to the may, may just go to the boardwalk and walk around. Obviously, staying at the hotel not an option. All right, the, this is a this is a group event. All your day and all your minutes and seconds are going to be planned out. All right, so you'll need five to ten dollars to cover that. I, I will be shopping this week. When you get up in the morning, there'll be breakfast sausage, breakfast sand, the the sandwiches that you can heat up and you can have. Um, so they will be you know, a variety within reason. There'll be cereal, there'll be milk, uh, there'll be bread, there'll be lunch meat for lunch, there'll be peanut butter and jelly. I will, I will have a series of snacks. I, I will have bullet so hopefully in the mixture you'll find a snack that you can eat in the life of you. Take some cereals, a snack, whatever the, the uh, case is. If you have any special food needs, like gluten intolerances or something, that's a, you got to look at dairy. You know, if you're a non-dairy, you need to get almond milk or lactate. You know, probably could get the lactate and wouldn't kill the rest of us. Uh, but if there are, please let me know. All right. If anyone's want to diet. And ladies and gentlemen, if you guys would like snacks, I need for you to let me know by Tuesday. I will personally go out and buy extra snacks, if needs be. Uh, yeah, I mean, you should, because I'm going to try to do it all at Costco and Large Paul, and there'll be plenty of stuff there. So okay. I will have a lot of cases of water. Uh, I'm not going to buy sodas. I'm not going to buy any of them. Water available any time that, that you want to take it back for The cost of things like sodas and stuff at the convention center when we're there are like buying at any stadium. You're going to spend two bucks for soda about the big. Right? It's just, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't, don't do it. You need to understand too, there's one concession stand and there'll be three to five thousand kids and adults. One concession stand. I'm trying to think if I could or not. I, can't remember what I, I think I think I took my water because I carry a water bottle in my backpack. I mean, I mean, I carry my water bottle. I don't know if the electric drink so this is good. I think the only person that would probably be able to do that would be a guy that would Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're going to get a wristband. You guys all know what the wristbands are they put on. And you're going to get that, get that on. It needs to stay on.